Hi, I'm Dominic Patton, and thank you again for joining us on Next Generation TV. I'm here with Carrie Kuhn from, let's be honest, Fargo and The Leftovers. Yes. So you, along with Isha Hines and a few others this year, you're mm -hmm. one of the few double dippers. Yes. So I'm interested in that in terms of like, how do you organize that in your life? Well, it's interesting because we didn't, we didn't shoot at the same time, though the shows are running concurrently. I still feel like I'm getting away with something and someone's going to come take it back. But you're only allowed so much TV time? Yes, I mean, it just, I, I couldn't believe it when, when Noah and the gang approached me to do Fargo and I had just, I made the Fargo deal on the way to Australia. So to do, I knew, to do leftover yes. season three. So I knew when we were shooting season three that, the, that Fargo was coming up when I was finished. So I knew as an actor, you always want the next thing because then you can relax a little bit because you know you don't have to try to get a job. So you can do the job you're doing. But this is almost like your Commonwealth tour. You go to Australia, you go to Canada. <laughs> yes, I hadn't thought about are you that. Are you not going to be, we're going to find out me. in a little while you're going to be in James Cameron's next Avatar <laughs> totally. movies in New Zealand. Close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you worked on the season, season three, which is the final season of it Leftovers. And one of the best shows on television. Thank you. And you guys have done, you and Justin and Damon and everyone involved. Thank you. I'm really proud of it. an amazing job. Thanks. But how is that in terms of your prep? Because obviously working with Noah mm -hmm. Hawley and the Fargo Gang, which is an anthology series, mm -hmm. and you're with Ewan McGregor in that this yeah. year. But you know, you have to prep for that as well. So as an actor, mm -hmm. how do you make that transition? Well, you know, what's interesting is that Nora is very inside out. So preparing for Nora was very much about the psychological condition Which is your condition character she's on the leftovers. In. Yes, correct. But Fargo, I found to be very outside in. Because by the time you put on those big living room boots and a, you know, a down Parker. jacket and a stiff police uniform and a 15-pound hip-chafing belt, and then you start speaking in that dialect and you put your little hat flaps on, you're, you're three-quarters of the way there. And then... Noah's language is so specific that then that's about that's all you need. Now, now talking about that in terms of the physicality and the mm -hmm. preparation, how did you find working, because you're working with, look, I'm not going to blow smoke, <laughs> but you're working with pretty great writers yeah. and pretty great showrunners on both. How did you find keeping the language and keeping, keeping that tone? Because especially as you mm -hmm. talk about with Nora, especially as you and Justin Thoreau's character go to Australia for the end of the world. Yeah. Um, there's a very, very distinct emotional arc happening there. Mm -hmm. yes. As opposed to on Fargo, there's another type of emotional arc unraveling in a right. different way. Yes, I suppose, um, I suppose I always come back to the language because, as you say, the benefit of working with people of that caliber is that everything you need is on the page. You could do nothing else except show up and say the words and you're going to be most of the way there. And I, I give them a lot of credit for that. And eventually, you know, you play a character for two or three years and, and she's in your body. I mean, at the beginning of a season, I, I say it always feels like putting on a wet bathing suit at first. It's like, you know it's your bathing suit, but it feels a little uncomfortable. And that's how it feels when you get back into a season. But ultimately, you know, by the end of uh, Leftovers, I know Nora better than anyone. And then Damon knows her almost as well as I do. But then flip that, though, because right. of course, Fargo being an anthology series, mm -hmm. you haven't had two or three seasons no. to lead up as, as the sheriff. You're now like, right. you're in this, and it's a contained thing. I mean, that's pretty why much, I if think Noah keeps it as he has, it's a contained yeah. thing. Yeah, I think that's why the, what's so great about Fargo is that, it, like I said, it's very external. There are a lot of conditions on Fargo. You're up there in Canada. It's cold. You're dressed a very particular way. You've worked up on a, that dialect, which was not far from me. I'm from Ohio. I went to school in Wisconsin. So also there was something about just the fundamental character of Fargo that's actually even closer to me than Nora is. I mean, those are my people. We are the emotionally repressed Midwest. That's where I grew up. The only people in the world who immigrated from a, one cold country yes. to a colder place. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. It's very unusual. N looking at that, I mean, you, you of course, you won a Tony Award for Who's Afraid of Virginia I was Wolf. nominated, but Judith Light beat me. I love I'm Judith sorry Light. I had that it's wrong. It's okay. I'm just trying to butter you up. It was so well deserved. <laughs> Nonetheless. You, you had, you've had a very strong career in theater, mm -hmm. but you really, you, your, your TV time it's, has not been long. I mean, no, it's only been about five early. or six years. You started at you know, the Playboy Club was your first time on yeah, the small screen. It was, yeah. And to think that you went from that, yeah. which is where you are now, mm -hmm. did you see yourself as a television actor? Oh, or no. did you, do you think primarily, I'm a theater actor? I mean, I was doing, I was doing um, Shakespeare in Wisconsin for four years at, at American Which Players sounds, like, a, sounds like another FX show unto itself. <laughs> it could be. It really could be. It's an extraordinary place. And I was perfectly comfortable. I had a very comfortable life. You know, in Chicago at that time, you could be a theater actor and make a living. So I didn't have another job. I wasn't waiting tables. I was just going on and off unemployment. I did some, you know, I did motion capture work for video games, and I, I edited some dissertations. Because you have to tell us what games. Um, I mean, there's a whole Fargo crew going to be out there like buying Wolverine and Return to Castle Wolfenstein. They're older. They were with Raven Software I've got in, in Wisconsin. Yeah. Ah. It was Return to Castle Wolfenstein. It was the next iteration. The sequel. But I did all the women and some of the an some of the. Uh, animal work, like the monster work in that. Some you, of the you, you get kidnapped work. a lot. When you're, when yeah, you're doing mocap as a woman, you get, you're always getting kidnapped and beaten and smothered and drowned. 
Sort of like but, Fargo. Yeah, it's not. It's, and, and, it it mean, really the, prepared the, yeah. me well for the rest of my career. But you never. But you, you but thought no, to yourself, this was a comfortable life. You don't life. get famous from there. You yeah. don't get famous from Chicago. We all know that. That's what's so extraordinary about, particularly the theater community, is that, look, in New York and L.A., everyone's trying to get the next thing. In Chicago, you're doing the thing you're doing when you're doing it, and there's something about the quality of that that's different because people are very present in the work that they're doing. And because the ensemble ethic reigns supreme in Chicago, you know, it's the land of Steppenwolf the home, Theater. Home of Steppenwolf, and, and, yes, exactly. exactly. So uh, all the young theater companies are trying to build companies. So you have these companies of actors working together for years at a time. They have these really um, intense relationships, and they're making really great theater. It's the best theater town in the country. And then, you know, that I just happened to be in a play that went to Broadway. That's the only reason this is happening for me. Because did you, did you think, though, at that time, mm -hmm. and, and sorry to interrupt, but did no. you think in many ways that that, you know, as you said, people come to L.A., people come to New York, and you're in it. Like, mm -hmm. you're like, I was in the Starbucks, and all of a sudden Jerry Buckheimer was there, and sure. I was like this and that. But being in the Windy City, which has a very rich theater, mm -hmm. theater and media community of its own, of course, right. but it gave you time to kind of grow and, and find your muscles as an mm -hmm. artist? Well, of, of course. I mean, I think there's no better training than being on stage. I, it makes me sad when I see young actors who want to be famous television stars, but they don't want to go through the theater because here's the thing. The theater requires you to act with your whole body. And oftentimes, I think if you just do TV and film for so long, you learn how to do it right here, but it's not fully embodied, I don't think. And, and I think these young people would really that? benefit. I mean, I'm uh -huh. I remember once reading a story, an interview with Richard Burton. Okay. And people were talking to him about his marriage with Elizabeth Taylor mm -hmm. and the scandals and the, the paparazzi and whatever. And he right. said, yeah, but hold on a second. Elizabeth taught me how to be a movie star. Mm. And well, sure. The interviewer went, what do you mean? He goes, I did theater. I knew how to say, ye kings, and come right. with us and wave my hand. Yes. I didn't learn that it was looking in the camera and squinting a tiny bit that would convey all that right. emotion. But I think it's much harder to scale down than it is to scale up. Oh, really? I do, because I think, look, I think acting with your whole body gives you a root in your, in your gut, and you can sort of build from there. And I think if you're not rooted, if you haven't done the vocal work, I mean, so, so many people think that, like, you don't need to do vocal training if you're going to be on TV. Well, you know what? I held somebody hostage for CBS for 17 hours. So it's, it, it requires that of you, and I think some people don't get that training. And so, you know, you can't do a scene for 12 hours a day. Hello. Hi. Is this Nora Durst? Yes. Who is this? Is this a secure line? Who is this? It's Mark Lynn Baker. Who? Mark. Lynn Baker. I'm uh, calling on behalf of a third party, and they've, well, they've asked me to ask you, would you like to see your children again? What? Your children, Aaron and Jeremy, would you like to see them again? I've got news for you, you shit. Your third party obviously doesn't know that I'm a fraud investigator for the DSD and I'm going to have this call traced and I'm going to find out what exactly it is that... They know your kids' names, Nora. I'm pretty sure they know what you do. And they don't care. You don't have to trace me. I'm at the Crown Central in St. Louis. Just ask for Mark Lynn Baker. Talking about um, the final season of Leftovers, mm -hmm. what are your feelings about that? I mean, this is a show that started off based on, on Tom's book and, and mm -hmm. you know, a really strong book. But for a lot of people, myself mm -hmm. included as a TV critic, it was season two, and especially this mm -hmm. latest season, where free of the book, mm -hmm. it went in a much more triumphant and interesting place. Sure. How did that seem from your point of view? Well, of course, I, I was a fan of the book. I knew the book very well. And I was curious how we were going to extend beyond it, because I knew the first season encompassed the whole of that story. But I do feel that, um, I, think, I think Tom Parada appreciated it too, when you let Damon Lindelof go. Um, it's kind of extraordinary what's going to happen. And, and Tom is really generous about knowing that this isn't his book anymore, it's something else. I also feel like Damon's, wherever Damon is in his life, impacts the work he's making. So I feel like we're seeing a little, little pathway of Damon Lindelof's like mental health from one to three, and that he recovered, we, you know, we recovered our sense of humor in season two. Because for me, the thing that was challenging in season one was that I thought, I thought we, we could have used a little more humor, because I know my family, when things are challenging, without a sense of humor. Gallows humor, humor all the yes, time. Yes, exactly. And that's how human beings deal with tragedy, really. So anything that doesn't include that rings a little false to me. And you really see that in season three. I yes. mean, especially right oh, at the beginning the when they set you guys up. Are, yeah. I mean, it's fascinating and it's really wacky. And, and I love it. I, I love how wacky and wild and unexpected it all is. It's really bold storytelling. And they, they don't feel, we don't feel constrained by the expectations of what television has been in the past. And 
I just really respect some. I re respect those bold choices. I think it's it's so much fun to do. So now, so having said that, mm -hmm. all the years you were on the stage, mm -hmm. coming late to television. Yeah. What's your opinion of the small screen nowadays? Oh, I mean, I, I like I say, I have a really new respect for what actors are doing. Here's the thing, is that we have this expectation for production value and still the same amount of time to shoot everything. So basically, people are executing cinematic feats in, in television time, which is extraordinary. And I kind of wonder if they, gave, if they gave us more time to make TV, how much better it would even be. But don't you think also, too, that then there's mm -hmm. the flip of that? Because every artist, I mean, right. James Cameron will say, I could need more money, right? Everyone yeah. could always say <laughs> sure. that they, they need sure, more. Sure, the shoestring but, budget. But if you flipped it and yeah. then said, well, like, hey, you know what? There's 365 days in the year. Take 360, do whatever you need to do, right? right? It would get Maybe indulgent. Maybe that would also be people, it'd be like, yeah. be like those concept albums that are like 18 sure. million overdubs. Sure, no doubt, no doubt. I mean, the pressure certainly adds a lot to it. It just, because I come from the theater and because we have rehearsal, when you think about doing a scene on TV, I inevitably feel that we've done, we've finally done it, we kind of find our groove, and then it's over. Then you're moving on to the next scene. And I think, oh, if I could just take three more runs at that thing, I bet it could go a little deeper, but there's no time to go deeper. So you have to come in with your own process, which is what I really respect about TV actors. They have to come in having done their homework. You don't get to find it in the room with other people. You have to bring something to the table, and I think that's really really extraordinary but it's it's an amazing time it's an amazing time to be an actress on TV I mean I'm there are so many more interesting roles for me to play now than there would have been 10 years ago so coming up at the time I'm coming up is I mean look at the two parts I've gotten to play it's that wouldn't happen for me well thank if you I came for bringing it to later. the table today thank you for having me I appreciate it